So in April 2022, Atlassian experienced a major, major, major outage where they permanently deleted the data of 400 of their paying cloud customers and it will take them weeks to recover it. In this video, we will do an engineering deep dive of this outage trying to extract key insights about their systems and practices. We will talk about six key engineering designs and insights on how similar systems are built and most importantly, understand why is it taking so long for them to recover the data. Instead of speculating, we will use their officially released outage report and dissect it line by line. I have linked the report in the description down below. And just before we proceed, a small disclaimer, I do not have any insider information and this is pure speculation based on this outage report. But before we move forward, I want to talk to you about a code based course of system design that I have been running since March 2021. Right? If you are looking to learn system design from the first principles, this course is for you. Because this is a cohort based course, it will not just be me rambling a semi optimized solution thinking it's the most amazing solution out there. Instead, it will be a collaborative environment where every single person who is part of the cohort will can pitch in his or her ideas and we will evolve our system around that. Right? Every single problem statement comes with a brainstorming session where we all together brainstorm and evolve our system. That's why everyone understands the kind of trade offs we made while making that decision instead of just saying hey we'll use a particular queue we'll have the justification why we use only that queue why we use that particular database why sql why not no sql right how are we leveraging throughput how are we ensuring that our system scales that's the highlight of this course this course is taken by more than 500 engineers to date spanning nine countries and seven cohorts right people from all top companies have taken this course and the outline is very intriguing it's very exciting so we start with week one around, we start with the core foundation of the course where we design online offline indicator. Then we try to design our own medium. Then we go into database where we go in depth of database locking and take and see few very amazing examples of data log, uh, database locking in, uh, in action. And how do we ensure that our system scales through that? Then the third week is all about going distributed where we design our load balancer. I'll walk you through the actual code of a, of, a, of a toy load balancer and understand how TCP connections are managed and how simple it is to build load balancer. Then week four is about all about social networks. Week five is all about building your own storage engines. Like we'll build that intuition on if you were to ever design your storage engine, how would you do that? Right. Then week six is about building high throughput systems. Seven is about building uh, IR systems, basically information retrieval systems and ad hoc designs where we design our own message brokers like SQS, where we design distributed task scheduler. And we conclude the course with week eight, where we talk about the super clever algorithms that has powered or that has made those systems possible. Right. I have also attached a video verbatim as is from my first quote, where we designed and scaled Instagram notifications. I will highly encourage you to check this video out. Right. And now back to the video. So going through this outage report, we see what exactly happened on Monday 4th of April approximately 400 Atlassian cloud customers experienced a full outage across Atlassian products like Jira, Confluence, Status Page and whatnot and they are in process of restoring websites, uh, restoring the sites 45% of impacted users and the full recovery of for all the impacted customers will happen in next two weeks. So it's a very long outage taking them very long to recover the, the data. So to be clear this incident was not a cyber attack nor was it a failure on our systems to scale. This was because this happened because of a miscommunication, which we'll talk about later. But one key insight before we move forward is additionally, the majority of restored customers have no data loss, while some have reported a data loss for up to five minutes prior to the incident. Hmm, why so? Reported a data loss for up to five minutes prior to the incident. Because when the incident happened, they deleted they permanently deleted the the data of the customers right but then why are they like why the report says that few customers reported a data loss for up to five minutes prior to the incident this shows that what atlassian has is an incremental backup policy right where what do they do is whenever let's say someone like any right hub that happens on the database is then backed up at a frequency of five minutes into their backup DB, right? So this has to be an incremental backup that is happening on their system. Now, how in real world, how does this backup actually happen? A keyword that I would want to throw at you is CDC. It is CDC stands for change data capture in which you take the updates from one DB and seamlessly 
replay those updates. You take the changes happening on the database and put it somewhere else. Now this could be another database or a flat file or anything. Right. If you look out for CDC, you will find some amazing insights out of it. So CDC is a very, very, very standard procedure that everyone follows. Right. So five minutes prior to the incident. So when the incident happened, basically when the script ran and it actually permanently deleted the, the data, there would have been the data that would have only been present in their main database and was not backed up, was not fully backed up, for example. Right. So which is why when they accidentally deleted the, the, the data, it was not available in the backup DB. Right? What does this mean? This means that if this DB is deleted, there is no copy of that data ever. So then could be, then it could lead to uh, a, a permanent data loss, which is what happened in case of some customers. And one thing to note that this only happened for a few of their customers. So majority of restored customer have no data loss. While some have reported, some have reported, it's still not confirmed. But in general, if you have a backup or a restore or if you have a backup strategy, like an incremental backup strategy in which you run at a particular frequency, then this can have an impact around permanent data loss in case of a permanent delete happening on your primary DB. Right? Okay. Let's move to the second part of it. Let me start by having saying the idea, da, 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 but ha, what happened? This is where the most interesting part is, why, does, like, like, why did this happen? How did they permanently delete the data of 400 of their cloud customers? So one of the standalone apps, Jira Service Management and Jira software called Insights Asset Management was fully integrated into our product as native functionality. So they were building a new version of their app and which had to be integrated into their main suite of products. And because of this, we needed to deactivate the standalone legacy app on the customer sites that had it installed. Our engineering team planned to use an existing script to deactivate the instance of this standalone application. Right? But before we move into what exactly happened, let's talk about this deactivating the standalone legacy app. So this shows us that what Atlassian actually has is a strategy around progressive rollout. So what happens is they might like any in any case, whenever a company is releasing something, they don't release a new shiny thing to all the customers at once. They typically do a progressive rollout of it. Right. So one such thing where you might have a legacy app, you might have a new version of this app, you might have five customers. Then what you do is your three customers like C1, C3, C4 might be using the legacy app while you roll out your new version to a subset of users, let's say C2 and C5. And then once you are sure on that, you would want to roll it out to more users. So then seamlessly transition or seamlessly roll the features out, the roll the new version out to the people who are on the legacy version. Right? Now what does this mean is when Atlassian tried to do it, they had to deactivate the legacy app, basically remove the connections of legacy app from this customer sites, which requires them to physically alter the data, uh, transform the data or delete the data for some reason. Like you, it, it is very subjective to the system at hand, but overall, this is how the flow looks like where you do a progressive rollout of an app, you roll the new version out to few users and then you increase it to all the users. So making them a very seamless transition and you being able to very quickly identify if there are any issues or bugs or whatnot in the system. Right? So, and to do this, to move from one version to another, they use their existing scripts to deactivate the legacy version. Now, how do they deactivate legacy version? It's up to them. Right? But what it looked like is deactivating legacy version required them to delete some data or basically mark for deletion or something around that. It required them to update or delete some of the data. Right? Okay, then next, what happened next? Why did this happen? Communication gap. First, there was a communication gap between the team that requested the deactivation and the team that ran the deactivation. So they have two teams, one who requested for the deactivation, ki now this new feature needs to be rolled out to this set of users and the team who ran the deactivation. Now, this is the interesting part. Instead of providing the IDs of the intended app, ki I only want to deactivate this app 
being marked for deactivation, the team provided the IDs of the entire cloud site, which means they instead of giving them the app ID, they give them the customer ID. So when they gave the customer ID, they deleted the entire customer's data instead of deleting the app's data. So this was a like this seems very weird, right? Ki how how this could have happened? Like this is such a simple rookie mistake where you were where people were not explicit enough into stating the requirements. So one thing as engineers we should always do is be very explicit, give prescriptive information, give exactly what needs to be done rather than saying ki ha this needs to be rolled out to this thing. So these are the IDs, roll it out. Be explicit on what exactly needs to be done. So what happened was the team provided the uh, IDs of the cloud site where the apps to be deactivated. So the team that ran the deactivation got the IDs of the sites. So they ran the deactivation of the site. Second reason is the faulty script. So now this gives us insight about soft delete versus hard delete. So what happened when the team that ran the deactivation ran the script. So the script that we used provided both mark for deletion which is the capability that they use in the day to day operations and permanently delete capability that is required to permanently remove the data. Now here we see two insights out of this. First is soft deletes versus hard deletes. So what happens? The script had functionalities to do both mark for deletion which is soft delete and permanently delete which is hard delete. So what happens? So mark for deletion versus permanently delete. So whenever you delete a post on any website or basically whenever you're doing any deletion, it is always preferred to do a soft delete of it. So engineers, instead of writing delete from this table, they would write, they would update the row and set is deleted to two. This helps them to recover the data in case someone wants to recover it. Like for example, if you wrote a blog on any blogging website, you deleted it, it would go into an archive state and then from which you can recover the, uh, you, you can recover it. So how is this recovery possible? Because when you deleted it, instead of permanently deleting the row from the table, it actually did a soft delete of it. So this is marked for deletion. This is still not permanently delete. Then the other mode, so this is typically called a soft delete. And then there is another thing called as permanent deletion, which is hard delete, in which you actually fire delete from this table, which is hard delete. So now when you physically delete the row, it is not possible to recover it. Right? But you would say, ki, if the soft delete is working fine, then why do we need hard delete? We need hard delete because compliance. I'll give you an example. GDPR. GDPR gives us or gives users, as in we as an end consumer, the power like or the right to be forgotten which means you can reach out to any gdpr compliant website and say i want to delete all of my uh, data from your website and i have the right to be forgotten so delete the existence of mine from your system and that company if it is gdpr compliant would have to permanently delete they cannot do soft delete because if you do soft delete there will still be traces about you in their system they would have to permanently delete uh uh, your data from their system, be it any subsystem, main database, transactional database, analytics database, whatever, they would have to delete anything that could trace that information to you, right? And which is why on this report, you say, you see that permanently delete capability that is required to permanently remove the data, which is required for compliance reasons. And these are the key compliance reasons why people would have to physically hard delete the, the, the data. Right. The script was executed with the wrong execution mode and the wrong ID list, which means that instead of doing soft delete, they did permanent delete on what? Instead of doing it on the individual app, they did it on the customer website. So they permanently deleted the entire customer site, which led to this outage. Now what next? The next part is what are we doing to recover it? This is where we get insights about their replication strategy and their backup strategy. Right? So what do they say? They say to ensure high availability, we provision and maintain a synchronous standby replica. Now what is synchronous standby replica? So what happens is this is the fourth insight that we get. Like how do companies in general give you high availability? Right. 
so high availability implies that no, if your database goes down there has to be a copy of your data which is a point in time like literally if you crash a particular database you would have zero data loss and you would be able to recover or restore the entire site in a gif so how do that happen so a very popular strategy for this is called as synchronous standby replication so you typically have like you whenever user talks to an api server api server writes to the database the write would be successful in a synchronous standby replication what do we have for every database out there there is a synchronous standby replica so whenever a write happens from the user onto the db the db first applies the write on its own copy then it sends out the write to the standby db instance this standby replica is not serving any traffic its job is to purely accept the writes from the main db apply it there once the write is applied onto the standby db standby db replies back to the main database ki hey i have completed the write once the main database gets an update from the standby key the write is completed there it would then acknowledge the write to the user so the user's write is not complete unless it is written in the main database and the standby replica database right so this way you will always have two copies of your data one in the main db one in the standby replica db right so if your main db goes down due to some reason the data would always be there in your standby replica db with zero replication lag which is why it is called as synchronous standby replica and it is standby it is not serving read request at all the only job of this database is to be on standby and have the latest data that happened or the latest write that happened onto the db having it on its own and so this is how in general if you'd want to ensure very high availability of your critical systems like let's say payments extremely critical systems because this is very expensive to do you would want to have a synchronous standby replica for that right and this is a very 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 common practice for any mission critical subsystems of your uh, of your architecture right what next so they have synchronous standby replica in multiple aws availability zone the easy failover is automated and typically takes 60 120 days. this is more on the infra side of things but you basically get the gist on how are they ensuring the availability of data right so if the database goes down there is still no data loss because there is a permanent uh, uh sorry uh, uh, because there is a synchronous standby replica which has zero replication lag and can take the place of the main database okay now what next we also maintain immutable backups that are designed to be resilient against data corruption events which enable recovery to a previous point in time backups are retained for 30 days and atlas and continuously test and audits storage backups for restoration now what do we learn from here we learn a key highlight is immutable backups so what are these so obviously keeping standby instances might be very costly right because you are literally running two instances of of the database and doing it at scale for every single database you have is literally doubling your database cost so what do companies do to to reduce the cost is they do immutable like they have this strategy where you do synchronous replication of writes into the synchronous uh, into your standby replica and from there periodically let's say after every day you take the dump of last days worth of data and put it into a cheap storage like s3 like here what they might do like assuming they like we know that they are on aws assuming that they might that they are using s3 for that so from the standby replica periodically like let's say your uh, it's zero replication lag from main db to replica now every day a job might run that would copy the data of the previous day and put it in a compressed mode and store it onto s3 and this is the, this is that immutable backups that they are talking about right and this immutable backups they are stored on s3 this would keep their standby replica size to a bare minimum and they can run a very small instance rather than running an equally scaled up version of their database right they can run a small instance and save the cost their disk cost cpu cost everything gets uh, gets reduced so it's very cost efficient and how do how anyone would guarantee uh, like they said that they have protection against data corruption so how do they how they would have guaranteed that is using error correcting codes like standard procedure error correcting codes while they are uh, serializing data in some format to store it onto s3 because you cannot just take 
your db dump and store it or your rows and dump and store it there has to be a, a particular format that they might be using to store that data onto s3 and they might be using some sort of error correcting codes to drive that what next using these backups we regularly roll, roll back individual customers or small set of customers who accidentally delete their own data now this is where the fun part begins he how their recovery process looks like so they use these backups the, the the backups we just talked about to roll back individual customers data or a small set of customers who accidentally deleted their own data because the data is there in the backup they can just take that dump and restore it into a database and done so the data is very easily restored right and if they've accidentally deleted the entire data is restored right and what we have not yet automated is restoring a large subset of customers into our existing environment now this is where we get insights about their multi tenant architecture so a multi tenant architecture says that every single customer that you have needs to have its own set of infrastructure that's a pure multi tenant architecture fine a pure multi tenant architecture so here what we talk about is we talk about multi tenant architecture from the data stores perspective so assume that you have eight customers c1 to c8 right so what you would want to have in a truly multi tenant architecture every customer is isolated and has its own setup of their api servers load balancers databases everything runs in its own isolated space but if you see having so many database like if atlassian has 60 or 70000 customers or even more than that they would want to have 70000 databases it's it's not feasible to have an operate at scale and gain profitability out of it because it's it becomes extremely expensive extremely expensive so that's where most companies who most companies uh, when they say they have multi tenant architecture they kind of have a hybrid model right for key for some of the key customers they would want to have an explicit setup but while they would be clubbing a few of their smaller customers together right so now purely talking from the data's perspective let's say each customer has its own set of database and then each one of these database has its own the backup policy that we just saw standby replica and then moving it on to s3 for their immutable backups right but if we do it for everyone that's a very it's, it's extremely costly so what most companies do and purely my speculation what most companies do is they have few large databases on which multiple customers share the data right so for example in one database they might have custom the data for customer c1 c2 and c3 in second database they have data for customer c4 c8 and in some they might have c5 c6 c7 this way they get the benefit of of load isolation while reducing the cost so it becomes very cost effective for companies to do this and most companies actually multiplex multiple customers data onto the same database rather into the same table itself and so this makes their architecture cost efficient for sure right and now what is happening is why is it taking so much time for them to recover the data okay let me just do this part ha huh? within our cloud environment each data store contains data from multiple customers this is where that insight is each data store contains data of multiple customers because the data deleted in this incident was only a portion of the data store that are continuous uh, that are continuing to be used by other customers we have to manually extract and restore the individual pieces each customer site recovery is lengthy and complex process now we'll take a look at how the recovery is happening this is where the fun part is chalo why is it taking so much time for them to recover the data so what is happening we know that multiple customers data is present on one data store so let's say hypothetically we have three data stores over here data store 1 data store 2 data store 3 data store 1 has data for customer c1 c2 c3 data store 2 has c4 c8 data store 3 has c5 c6 c7 now what did the script do let's say in the script they got id for customer c2 c4 c7 and it permanently deleted the data for c2 c4 c7 so from this data store the data for c2 is deleted from this data store data of c4 is deleted from this data store uh, the data for c7 is deleted now what happens because when we talked about archiving when we talked about backup 
the entire db is backed up as is right so when the entire db is backed up as is when a db is backed up let's say data store 1 is backed up when it is backed up the data for customer c1 c2 c3 multiplexing on the same data store is backed up right so and similarly for data store 2 and data store 3 so now what is happening is when they would want to restore the data they can restore they can have a point in time recovery of that entire data in one shot so like for example if this data store 1 is backed up and they would want to restore it back at a particular time instant what would happen is they can just go to that backup and then they would load that backup into a new db and start pointing it to this one so the data or the entire data store moves back in time to that particular instant right but here what happened is because from this entire data store only a subset of rows were deleted of those particular customers restoring them becomes a very painful process because now hypothetically let's say we have a table this is the table id having rows and each row having some sort of customer id and what we know that data from the data store one the data of c2 is deleted so what would have happened is the row 125 1096 and 2709 would have been deleted right but when you are restoring the data from the backup right what would happen is it would restore the data for c2 very well right c2 this row this row would be restored but because c1 and c3 were not impacted these customers kept on receiving the writes right because their system was functional they kept on receiving the writes so the new data for this customers kept kept on adding to the database so now when atlassian would try to restore the data from the backup they would they can number one restore the entire table as is but what would this mean this would mean that the unaffected customer would see a data loss because let's say when the c2's data was deleted after which c1 and c3 received some updates if you restore the data to a, a point in time in before the new updates that happened are lost for unaffected customers this is very catastrophic because c1 c3 were not affected but they are experiencing data loss so now what restoration policy that they would want to employ here is they would be restoring the backup of these users onto a different database and they would have to manually iterate through the rows for their customers and then put it back into the main table and this is extremely lengthy process because the the backup that we're talking about is in is in few hundred of gbs because the amount of data uh, atlassian has for customers it's it's insanely high so for every backup that they have they would have to restore it iterate through those rows manually when they're iterating through those rows manually they would have to extract the rows for the customers that have been deleted take that ingest it into their primary database and then that site is restored so because this is an extremely lengthy process where it's not just a matter of you restoring that backup and spinning off a new db they have to literally go through at plus given that they would have hundreds of tables with so many foreign keys and what not as a problem like they cannot insert the data unless the foreign key exists so they would have to declutter the the relationships between the table to understand ki which table to restore first which table to restore second and this process that they would have to write scripts to do it because doing that manually it's obviously not possible they would have to still go through those scripts and that scripts would take hours and weeks to run and which is why the recovery is taking so long to happen because they have to physically load the data store into a database extract the rows like understand which rows needs to be restored first which rows needs to be restored second and then apply it onto their main db and which is why their recovery process is taking weeks for them to happen for smaller set of users it was uh, for a for a smaller customers it was simple and they mentioned that they have actually done it in the past right but when this at this scale this happened for the large subset of users 400 customers massive amount of data and some of them might be very large customers as well it would take time for them to recover the data because they are doing that explicitly going through row by row and trying to apply that right so this is why atlassian is taking so much time for to do the recovery because the recovery is a very lengthy and complex process requiring internal validation 
and final customer verification when the site is restored again which table to load first is uh, and while restoring there is no data loss there is no like existing customers are not affected so many things to take care of right so this is what exactly happened uh, like my speculation of what what could have happened during this outage and some key insights about it baki with respect to the status report they are just saying that how they are restoring the data and they uh, they are shifting to more automated process re enabling metadata of deleted sites into a centralized orchestration system restore customer data extracted from backups including users permissions etc re enable existing system app billing information basically it's all about that ki they would be much more prepared about and uh, about a similar outage in the future <laughs> but I, i really hope that 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 doesn't happen and they solve the communication first versus anything else So yeah, that's about status report. I'll link again. I'll link the status report in the description down below. And I really hope you understood something interesting and amazing out of this. And there is always something new to learn from outages. Like you get to experience ki so many components they come together, so many things that come together and build a system. One thing goes down, and so many things are affected. So nice, chala. That's it. for this video if you guys like this video give this video a thumbs up if you guys like the channel give this channel a sub i post three solid in depth engineering videos every week and i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton